I'm Francesca Nestor, Assistant Professor in Politics and Government. I am co-director of the COVID-19 course along with Dr. Kira Bailey in Psychology and Neuroscience. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone back for the 11th lecture in our series. Today, we will learn from our panelists, Chris Fink, Liz Nix, and Ashley Allen. Dr. Christopher L. Fink began his career at Ohio Wesleyan in 2007, where he focuses his teaching in the areas of health behavior and health promotion, food studies, and qualitative inquiry. In recent years, he has focused primarily on dietary health and issues related to dietary decisions in the food system as a whole, including food insecurity. He has been working extensively in Italy with a particular interest in the relationship between Mediterranean culture and lifestyle, specifically Italian, and dietary movement behavior choices. Dr. Fink is currently a co-organizer for the Perugia Food and Sustainability Conference held at the Umber Institute in Perugia, Italy, every two years, and directs a cooking, food, and nutrition education program in Delaware County, Ohio, focused on reducing food insecurity that is a collaboration with Columbus-based Local Matters, the United Way of Delaware County, the Delaware County Hunger Alliance, and Share Our Strength. Dr. Elizabeth A. Nix is a registered dietitian nutritionist from Utah. She just concluded her second academic year at Ohio Wesleyan University. Her graduate school work focused on behavioral interventions in college students. She continues her research in behavioral interventions to improve the diets of various communities, particularly low-income communities. Dr. Nix teaches introductory nutrition and an advanced human nutrition and metabolism course. She enjoys learning and teaching about nutritional biochemistry. She is also interested in learning and teaching about the complex way foods work within our food system and what factors influence our eating behaviors. Dr. Nix is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Society for Nutrition Education and Behavior. Dr. Ashley Allen is a cultural geographer with teaching and research interests in human geography, qualitative methods, and the sociocultural interactions between humans and their environment. This summer, she is supervising a summer science research project focused on household sustainability initiatives, including composting various types of food waste. Dr. Allen teaches the department's human geography courses, including cultural, economic, and urban geographies. She encourages undergraduate research and has mentored students in the fields of health geography, qualitative methods, political geography, planning, resource management, and global economic development. As a reminder, you can use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. The panel will speak for about 50 minutes and then we will open up for questions if time permits. Our panelists will begin with an important presentation and then provide their scheduled COVID course panel, food systems and food security in the coronavirus pandemic. Before we begin, we wanted to recognize the events around the death of George Floyd and heeding the call of the Urban League and others for a day of action. We'll take eight minutes and 46 seconds. The time Mr. Floyd spent under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer to give each of you time to explore these or other resources for taking action in your community to make it a more united place and a safe place for all of us, but particularly our black friends and neighbors. The moderators and panelists will be quiet during this time to give you space to reflect, plan, or take action. There's a link in the, in the uh, slide and then one in the chat. It's the same link. It takes you to a document with a lot of resources. And so we just ask you to use this time as you like. Um, and we will be back in 8 minutes and 46 seconds.
Okay, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> we hope you found that useful and some good resources. Uh, we're going to start by just talking a little bit about how we uh, each came to be interested in the food system and food security <clears throat> issues, but um, we're going to get right to the meat of it after that. I know for me, uh, I teach classes, as uh, Francesca mentioned, on <clears throat> uh, community health, um, but going farther back, I, I became interested in more systemic factors because um, even when you study why people change health behaviors, um, many times there are, there are vast influences beyond that that make a big difference in how easy it is for us to pick a, a healthy behavior, not just pick it, but actually enjoy it. And, and um, so for me, that was a really important question. Um, and so those come to things like culture and the way that our political and, and, and distribution system happens and all the things that we'll talk about. So for me, that's really how I got interested in that. Um, so, like um, Chris Fink, I um, also got interested in food systems um, studies because I was looking a lot at dietary behaviors and how to change dietary behaviors. And again, um, there's all these systemic things in place that even when somebody is motivated to change their behavior, they're often inhibited or there's a barrier to change. Um, and so I really wanted to get into the systemic problems around our food. Um, I also, as a dietitian, feel a responsibility to our broader food system in that if we are making um, nutrition recommendations and neglect the broader impact that these nutrition recommendations might make when heated, uh, then we're probably not being good stewards of the earth. Uh, for me, um... As a geographer, I'm really just trying to look at the world spatially. Uh, so my research normally is on human environmental interactions um, in terms of culture, weather, and climate change. And when you're talking about climate change in a cultural way, most people want to know what they can do as individuals and talking about what we eat, how we eat, and how we waste what we eat is a big part of that. Uh, and we talk about that in two of my classes, uh, Introduction to Cultural Geography, uh, which is Geography 110, as well as Economic Geography, where we talk about all the processes uh, of how it goes from the farm to your plate. So we thought we would put this uh, image up here just to kind of highlight, I think, what a lot of people have been experiencing during uh, the time that we've been social distancing and related to COVID-19, um, that there's two types of people. Obviously, there might be more, but it's just funny in the sense that, um, you know, we all respond a little bit differently. I know for me, um, I've been eating a lot of different things, maybe more um, staples, rice, using flour. Maybe you've been making bread more like uh, during this time, or maybe not. Maybe there are other ways that you've engaged with food or differently during this time. Um, but I know each of us has had uh, some differences. Some of the things that I personally have done, I've been cooking a lot, um, eating a lot with um, family and friends. And once, one of the things that I've heard from my students is that they've actually really enjoyed this time because they've been able to sit down with their family and have a meal, something that they said they haven't really been able to do for years because of things like sports practice, school engagements, um, concerts, all of these things. And so uh, eating more together, sitting down as a family and having meals is something that I've noticed has really changed because of this. For me personally, I've cooked more in the past two months than I have in the past five years. Um, but don't worry for my students that know me, I'm still supporting fast food businesses. <laughs> so as we talk about how consumption patterns change, this also can influence um, our food system as a whole. So as we start talking about the food system, we really have to start talking about what the food system entails. So one of the things um, that I forgot to include in my introduction is that I'm now teaching a class about uh, called Global Food Systems and where I use kind of an interdisciplinary approach to talk about the various aspects of the food system. This model that we're going to use is just one of many examples of how we could portray what we call the food system. This is still incomplete and we'll talk about some of the additional aspects of the food system throughout this panel. Um, however, this is a really good model to demonstrate the food supply chain. 
The food supply chain consists of everything it takes to get our food from the farm to our fork and also includes everything that doesn't quite make it to our fork or the food that isn't consumed. And another term that I want to introduce before we begin and before we start talking about the food system in more depth is the idea of food system resilience. Um, this has kind of come about um, as people have started studying the food system more. Um, food system resilience is the capacity over time of a food system and its units at multiple levels to provide sufficient, appropriate, and accessible food to all in the face of various and even unforeseen disturbances. And I think if there's one thing we can all agree on, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak is definitely an unforeseen disturbance. So as we talk about the various aspects and components of the food system model, consider this idea of resilience in the food system. In the case of our current system, there may be some things that are very resilient, and then there may be some parts of our food system that are not resilient. So we really want you to think about the complexities of this food system model and this idea of food system resilience. So one of the first um, steps we're gonna talk about as we're talking about taking our food from farm to fork is obviously the farm. So um, one of the first steps we'll talk about is production or farming predominantly. So let's talk about what farming looks like in the US. I have a couple um, images here from the USDA. So this kind of gives you an idea of uh, some of the aspects of farming that we see here in the US. Since 1935, which was the peak of um, farms within the US, the amount of farms has actually decreased dramatically from 6.8 million to about 2 million. So we're seeing the number of farms going down. However, the average size has increased from about 155 acres on average to 440 acres on average, um, indicating that we're seeing a lot more large scale farming throughout the US. So although 90% of our farms are actually small scale farms, um, family owned small scale farms, the farms that account, uh, these farms only account for about 48% of the land use, meaning that the rest of that land use is taken up by either medium or large scale family farms. And only about 20% of the total farm income in the US is attributed to this 90% of small scale farms, indicating that the majority of the income is going to large and medium sized farms. So the large scale farms are about 40%, 46% of the total income for farmers. Small farms typically rely on income outside of the household. About 59% of small farms reported having a negative income from their farm products. So we're relying a lot more on these large farms and small farms are make, uh, having a really hard time making it in this really competitive large scale farming industry. The two major crops that you can see um, on this chart on the top left are corn and soy. So these uh, account for about 44% of the US crops. And many of these have very specific markets. So feed, ethanol, um, feed and ethanol for corn, soy has major exports. And some of these very specific markets might be impacted negatively by COVID-19, leaving these farmers to find an alternative market. And when you have a farm of 440 acres, that's a lot of produce to find a new market for. So anytime you see a disruption in the chain after that, you're going to see um, uh, negative impacts on these farmers. So these farmers will either have to find an alternative market, but they may also require emergency funding, funding from the government in the form of subsidies. Our major animal production is beef at about 40%, uh, poultry 26%, and dairy at 20%. So none of our food is really brought to our table in the form that it leaves the farm. Um, nearly everything that we get at the grocery store is uh, a product that has been processed in some way. So most of these products do not resemble the original food that it was made from. Indeed, as this uh, dollar demonstrates, um, about 85 or 86 percent of our food dollar, so this represents our food dollar, what we spend as consumers, about 85% of our food dollar goes to um, the manufacturing share. So processing, packaging, um, distributing, food service, and marketing. Um, most of the money is spent on those industries. Um, food processing often gets a very negative reputation, but nearly all of our food is processed in some way or another. 
my students often bring up the words processed food and how terrible it is for our health. And so I become really interested in talking about the complexities of processed food. I've developed a class that I'll be teaching in the fall to address these complexities and food processing in society as a whole. So although we often think of highly processed foods, when we're talking about processed foods, things like Doritos, instant mac and cheese, or Kool-Aid as our processed foods, the largest percent of processing sales actually goes to meat, the meat processing industry, primarily butchers. So as you can see by this other graph here, that largest portion of that pie is spent on meat processing. Um, there are obviously levels of processing. So butchering is not necessarily a highly processed um, food. It's just taking it from the one large component into smaller components. Um, but Food preservation, like canning, drying, fermenting, and curing, have enabled us as humans to create civilization as we know it. So we've left behind this hunting and gathering existence and now moved into this civilization where we can have what we call the leisure class. You know, we don't directly have to work with our food in order to eat. Um, so the availability and quantity of these shelf stable foods like canned bean, vegetables, and dried foods have become particularly valuable now. The ability to stockpile these basic shelf stable ingredients is really only made possible by our food processing. However, on the negative end of our food processing industries, these processing facilities can create bottlenecks for our food supply chain, something that both Chris and Ashley will discuss in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the distribution uh, of food. It's a pretty vast topic, so it's just really important to recognize that it exists in the food system. Um, it can be direct between the processor producer uh, to consumers, or it can be um, through a middle distribution chain. In a lot of cases with large-scale food production, um, and I have some experience with Kellogg company in particular, family kind of history with that, um, you know, the, the, a lot of times they're getting that food from one large producer, Kellogg, to a, a large distributor, Walmart. In fact, 30% of Kellogg sales are through Walmart. So, um, so other times there's a middle distributor. Um, some of you may shop at Gordon Food Service um, retail outlets, but they also are a food distributor who buys big quantities of food and distributes it for, distributes it for, um, for institutional use most of the time. Um, so distribution is a funny, uh, a funny area, but um, it can be the backup, <clears throat> the back, uh, the backlog, the bottleneck that we've been talking about. In addition, it, the packaging matters too. So I'm thinking about this COVID crisis in the sense that when, when I walk into the grocery store and I don't see certain products available, does that mean we have no more flour, that we have no more pasta? Um, no, but it may mean that that pasta or flour is packaged in a warehouse somewhere to be distributed for wholesale use when schools, um, restaurants, airlines, and other places are, are shut down. And so there can be some real complications in that distribution channel um, that, we'll, that we'll talk about. This is one spot where in terms of resilience, local food networks might be a little bit more resilient. The producer, if it's a farmer or a bread maker or a producer of honey, can get that product past these other two channels right to the consumer and other outlets like outdoor farmers markets that we're seeing pop up even in the midst of the crisis. So distribution um, can be uh, an interesting thing for us to, to look at. <clears throat> when we look at the food dollar, um, this is breaking it down a little bit differently. Uh, just to go quickly through it, one of the things that jumps out is food services. And um, this is setting up a bit of the story of what's going on right now. But if we think of that dollar, we think, well, I shop at the grocery store and I spend money at the grocery store. Why is that only 12.3% on retail trade? Um, part of that is the growing uh, eating away from home that's ha been happening for the last 40 years. And on the right, you can see this um, this data from the USDA kind of showing that eating away from home is now about 54% uh, of our spending <clears throat> um, happens for food away from home. Now that can include eating at a restaurant, but it can also include those other settings, hospitals, schools, airlines, etc. cetera. Um, that's up from 50% in 2009. And you can see in the 60s and 70s that that, um, that percent, well, that billion, those billions of dollars were low and the percent was low. Um, that doesn't mean we eat more than half of our meals away from home because it costs more to eat away from home, but it does mean that we're eating a substantial amount away from home. So then the COVID-19 crisis hits <clears throat> and we see some impact as we've seen um, as we've seen more recently. And so I'm going to jump to consumption now to consumers and spend a little bit of time there. Um, and uh, 
I'm going to kind of simplify the whole chain a little bit. This is coming from um, Refeed, a really interesting organization who's been thinking about food waste, which Ashley will talk a lot about. But if we simplify it, and there's two paths, right, through grocery or through restaurant and food service, um, that food is coming from farms, processors, manufacturers, and distributors. And one of those is just shut down. Um, <clears throat> it puts a lot of pressure on um, the grocery retail uh, aspect of getting the food to the consumer. Um, and so we see that backup happen across this food distribution chain. Um, farmers are, uh, this is hitting right as farmers are thinking about and planting and planning what to plant. And some farmers are growing half as much as they were in the past. So this isn't even a short term issue. Um, we may see lower amounts of yield coming on purpose because farmers don't want to have to uh, invest in, in crops that they're not going to actually, um, not, not going to actually sell. Um, on the flip side, Kroger saw a 30% of increase, 30% increase in sales um, in March. Uh, Albertsons, which is another grocery chain, um, partnered because of their rise in, in sales, partnered with some hospitality industries where jobs were lost to give jobs to associates from Hilton Hotels, uh, Regal Cinemas, that sort of thing. Um, online grocery sales went up as well. Um, as we know, small restaurants are struggling in the middle of this. And um, there were some micro grants available to get restaurants through, but those had to be, uh, when, it, when it went active through the James Beard Foundation, it was active for three hours and there were over 4,000 applications, they had to shut the grant process down. So the impact on um, that side that has the red line through it is, is strong. And then we see the impact on the grocery uh, and retail side as consumers in that as well. Um, <clears throat> and it looked like this, right? You went to the store, especially early on, but even still certain sections are kind of missing, uh, missing food. People made a run on flour, beans, pasta, bread, other ingredients, and stores couldn't keep up. Some interesting adaptations happened. This is a picture from a restaurant in Austin um, who, um, because they had access to the other distribution channel, the one that had restaurant grade, restaurant size, restaurant distribution, um, they were buying that food and then selling it as a small grocer. And, and in some cities we saw this happen, Los Angeles um, and others. So this adaptation was an interesting early adaptation. More recently, this is just from a couple of weeks ago, a picture that, um, uh, a picture of the Kroger store here in central Ohio, where um, they're starting to sell hotel and restaurant size flour. And there may be other things in the store as well. I found this kind of interesting in, in leading up to this class because I thought it would be a great example of, um, of adaptation. You know, somehow we were starting to get this flour. This is a 20 pounds of flour. And so if you're baking as much as some people are, maybe you need this. Uh, but 20 pounds of flour in the store uh, on the bottom shelf to give people the chance to get um, to get some flour. Also in this consumer realm is food, uh, food pantry. So that leads us into a discussion about food security. Um, if uh, we posted some readings, one of them talks a lot about uh, food security, hunger food pantries, and they're kind of interweaving with the food system, especially industrial food. Really interesting critique of that system. Um, the, I'd encourage you to take a look at, at that. But just really quickly, food security, um, is uh, defined by lots of different entities. The, the, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations defines it like this. Basically, when people always have access, both physical and economic access, to safe and nutritious food that meets their needs for an active and healthy life. Um, the USDA has had to refine that definition because they use it for data gathering. And so we have, in the US, we, uh, at least according to the USDA, we have four categories of food security. High and marginal food security are when people report very few or no indications of um, food access problems or limitations around food. Um, where low and very low food security are when people start to see reduced quality, variety, or desirability of their diet or um, disrupted eating patterns and reduced food intake. So when you see data about food security in the US, um, if people are food secure, if they're defined uh, that way in the data, they're in higher marginal food security. If they're food insecure, they're in low or very low. And low is the largest category of food insecurity in the US. Um, in fact, uh, those two put together is about 11% of US households in 2018 were, were food insecure, so low or very low food security. Here in Ohio, we're not doing quite as well as that, 14.5%, uh, which is over a million, uh, 1,600,000 people. 
8.1% uh, of people in Delaware County or over 15,000 in, uh, individuals are uh, food insecure here in Delaware County. In Franklin County, that's higher at 16.5%, 200,000 people. So um, this is a, and if you, there are great resources out there, you can look. Um, some counties are, uh, are much higher than that even. Um, food security, we kind of think about in four pillars of places that we can move the lever on food security. One is availability. So this is where uh, really looking at whether food is available, like um, <clears throat> we see shortages in the grocery store, that's availability. If, um, if there's a, a disease or a crop issue, there may be an effect on availability. Access is when we can get it. So this is about uh, how much we have spending power to, to access the food, whether there are grocery stores in our our neighborhoods and our areas, um, can we get it? Food may be available out there, but do we have access to it? <clears throat> Utilization is about um, our skills and knowledge about what uh, to eat and how to use it. So um, this says people don't just need food, they need the right kinds of food, but if they don't know how to prepare it or they aren't sure how to make that um, food stretch and they end up wasting it, that doesn't work either. And stability is the fourth pillar. Um, it needs to be consistent. And right now we're having an issue um, with stability, certainly um, as the COVID crisis hits. So it can be chronic, it can be ongoing in certain places, it can be transitory, which is a large percentage of people who use food pantries, at least here in the Delaware County area, meaning that <clears throat> they may have lost a job, it may be a month or two or, or more of food insecurity. Um, and then seasonal when something happens like what we see now when that really, really um, spikes. So um, you've probably seen, or maybe not, pictures of, of food pantries all across the country where people were lining up for food. Of course, the COVID version of that is people in their cars because we were trying to do social distancing. Um, there, there aren't um, as many lines of people close together, packed close together. This is from San Antonio. Um, these are all people waiting for food distribution in their cars. Um, you know, the unemployment rate jumped up to nearly 15% in April from three and a half percent in February. And so something like that is bound to have a huge impact on food security, especially, um, you know, seasonal food security. Um, food pantries are reporting 50% or higher uh, usage. Feeding America says 95% increase in demand and no change in their funding. In fact, sometimes less funding because the people who donate things are losing their jobs too. Um, the article talked about food banks and gro uh, getting supplies from grocers and large food companies. Um, since the groceries are running out of food, that's also a problem. So there's a lot of pressure <clears throat> on food, food banks and food pantries to get um, resources for people. On top of that challenge, as if that's not enough, you also get a decrease in volunteers. A lot of the volunteers um, are uh, at risk populations, older adults um, especially, and they aren't coming out to volunteer because it's unsafe. Um, and our frontline people, um, often coming from population, underserved populations um, who have less affordable health care, are also um, having struggles getting back to the distribution of food and all of those other things. And we're not doing free meals as often anymore. So a lot of things are putting pressure from COVID <clears throat> on food security, um, resources that were already stretched, really. I mean, the utilization of food pantries here in Delaware County is, is quite high. Um, and this isn't a short-term issue either because people were losing um, jobs and then we're maybe getting some forgiveness on, on utility bills or other things, but those bills aren't not forgiven permanently. They're just maybe pushed out. So we could be seeing a huge issue even as people return to jobs, um, you know, that's six months out or three months out from now. Another big issue that's going to be pretty interesting is food waste. I know some of you were having a uh, problem seeing the yellow. So that says food waste management. Yay. Um, and then it talks about compost, um, energy. So that's turning food waste into biogas and food rescue, which is um, both reducing our food waste by eating what we have and um, rescuing things like ugly vegetables in uh, terms of like meal delivery service or taking those things to food banks. Um, so before the pandemic, food waste was already a big issue. Somewhere between a third and a half of all food produced was either lost or wasted. We don't know the exact numbers because most people on the household level, myself included, would not tell you the truth about how much food they wasted 
um, <laughs> week to week. I mean, I'm not going to tell you about the sad spinach in my fridge, but y'all know that there are sad spinach in your fridges too, okay? Um, and what happens when we're wasting that much food is that um, we also are wasting money. So about a trillion dollars, that's with a T, um, of the, all the food produced is never eaten. And this happens along all stages of the food chain. Uh, and in low income countries, most of that loss occurs during production. Uh, but in developed countries like the United States, uh, much of it is wasted at the consumption stage. So every American, it's estimated, um, wastes about 220 pounds of food per person per year. To put that in perspective, I am an LSU Tigers fan. That is a Joe Burrow of food a year, okay? If y'all are from Ohio, bingo's fans too, whatever. So let's talk about the difference between food loss and food waste for a second. So uh, under the UN Safe Food Initiative, um, they've agreed to a couple of different definitions. Food loss is the decrease in quality or quantity of food at the production stage. So those are the vegetables that don't ripen enough before they get sent out, the things that rot, um, the product that literally just falls off the truck somewhere, it doesn't make it from the farm to the storage facility, or it can't be stored. Um, so it's something that gets lost during production, whereas waste is the removal of food from the supply chain that was at some point fit for human consumption. So we could have eaten it, but something happened where we didn't. And that's mainly caused by economic behavior, poor stock management, lots of grocery stores before this, as you've seen, you walk in and there are just thousands of oranges. There are so many oranges, no human could ever eat that many oranges because in our society, we want things to look plentiful, right? Um, and we want them to look good. We want them all to be the perfect color orange, the perfect shape, just ready for eating, okay? And then as uh, consumers, we buy seven because we think we're gonna eat an orange every day. We eat an orange the first day and then the rest of them sit on our shelf forever. That's not a judgment, it's just what happens. <laughs> so it's important to understand that food waste and food loss aren't the same, but food waste is a component of food loss. Um, and the difference isn't clearly defined. So we like to stick with production versus consumption. Um, and usually here in the United States, food waste on the consumption and retail side uh, is what we're worried about. But with a pandemic, we're seeing a lot more loss on the production and farming sides of the system. Um, this is really linked to what Chris was talking about in terms of distribution. So with the closing of restaurants, hotels, and schools, some farmers have no buyers for up to half of their perishable goods. And then storage facilities get inundated and they don't have room to store them either. Um, so what you're looking at is a field of onions that are just waiting to be buried, tilled over, and turned into sort of a compost-like substance because there's nowhere for them to go. Uh, and we also see this with dairy, um, the Dairy Farmers of America estimate that as much as 3.7 million gallons of milk per day is just getting dumped out because the cows are producing the milk no matter who's drinking it. Um, and so that's about 5% of the country's milk supply uh, that's currently just being dumped out every day. And on top of this, um, one of the other bottlenecks that we talked about, if you recall back to the um, processing slide, meat processing was one of that biggest chunk of that pie. And so those meat processing bottlenecks can contribute to additional food losses. A good example of this is the Smithfield Pork Butchering Company. So this is one of our major companies that process pork, but due to the COVID outbreaks, they actually had to close down. And so many of the farmers and those facilities have actually had to euthanize their pigs or to try and find a different market for those pigs. So I know that in the Delaware County, um, one of the food pantries is actually getting a donation of pigs. And it's, I don't know if it was this specific bottleneck that um, got them this new pig supply, but um, this is just one of those really interesting food loss changes. So these pigs are just being euthanized and not being used at all as a meat product because there's just not that market.
All right, so as mentioned before, um, that food system model is great, but it doesn't really encompass all of the different factors that can go into a food system. So there are a lot of things that can influence this food supply chain. And one of the major influences on our food supply chain are policies on either the federal, state, or the local level. So food policies are complex and difficult to establish and change. Our moderator, Dr. Francesca Nestor, um, actually teaches a class on food policy. And I've been really lucky to have her ha come to my class to be a guest lecturer. And I've been able to attend a couple of her classes on food policies. Um, from these lectures, I've learned a lot about the impact of food policies, as well as the complicated ways that these policies work, and why maybe it's not an easy thing to just establish a new policy that can make really good positive impacts on our food system. Some of the laws that we've talked about in my class um, relate directly to food, so things like organic food certification through the USDA, the um, FDA's generally recognized as safe list, um, food safeties and inspection, which is done by both the USDA and the FDA, uh, food labels, as you can see there in the middle, um, and then SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So this is what some people had called food stamps before. But then there are a lot of laws and policies that can impact our food system without being directly related to food. So things like minimum wage laws, city zoning, um, plastic bag usage, EPA regulations about landfill, recycling, even compost um, has a lot of EPA regulations around it. Policies may be one of the best ways to change our food system and subsequent dietary choices. Um, the example that I like to use in class is actually one that I got from Chris um, when I told him about how I accidentally forgot to put salt in my bread. Uh, he said it tasted like bread from Perugia, Italy, where he teaches his study abroad program. Um, and he mentioned that people in Perugia don't put their salt in, don't put salt in their bread. As it turns out, this is um, from a problem back in 1540. There was a salt war between the Pope and the Perugian area. As a protest, Perugians stopped adding salt to their bread. And this is a change that prevails even today. So now if you go to Perugia, Italy, you will have unsalted bread and they will claim that it tastes better than salted bread, which is just not true. <laughs> so I often try to challenge my students to think of policy changes that they could think of that might promote food, um, better food security, public health, or environmental sustainability, rather than focusing on personal behavior changes. Some examples my students have talked about are things like limiting the added sugars that processors can add to their foods, or restricting the amount of fast food establishments in a certain area. So some cities can only have certain amount of fast food areas. We have seen some laws change, um, particularly with the uh, pandemic. One interesting example is the changes in regional liquor laws. So the uh, state of Ohio allowed open containers to promote beverage purchases from local businesses. And even in the Delaware town, downtown area, you can now carry a drink around just that downtown area so that we can promote social distancing when people are going out for a drink with friends. So now you can walk around with your beer that you get from Barley Hopsters. Another really interesting policy is, um, came with the closing down of restaurants. So in Ohio, we had a really early uh, stay at home order and we had really good adherence to this stay at home order. But I wonder personally, if we would have had such good adherence if places like restaurants and cafes would have been allowed to stay open and it had just been advised for people to not go out to eat. Um, so this is a really good example about how policy could have had one of the largest impacts on our adherence to that stay at home order. Um, <clears throat> another lever or driver of the food system is culture and this is the, the one that I had to kind of think about and say, all right, I can't do my normal thing of talking about this for 10 hours or whatever, because it's really one of my favorite um, topics to talk about. But, um, <clears throat> but basically, when we talk about culture, we're, we're really talking about um, sort of a set of shared meanings, knowledge, values that a society um, has or a group of people has. And, and so we can stratify it through all kinds of groups. It's certainly changeable. Uh, it, it adapts with environmental things. And, and we've seen food culture sort of change a little bit. If you think about what you may value during a time like a pandemic, it, it may be a little bit different. You might wonder what this weird picture is over on the side. Um, those of you old enough would remember this is a um, this is a, a car cup holder, but it's a great reflection of US food culture because 
Um, these weren't necessary until they were, and drive through food culture became popular uh, in the 50s and 60s. And so we didn't have, we were eating in our cars, we were drinking in our cars. Also, the size of it is really interesting. I don't think you could get any fast food drink in that cup holder anymore. Um, they're all <clears throat> quite a bit bigger than that. But I say that because this is how we reflect culture is through our practices and our different artifacts. And so we can go to the grocery store and look at a box of, uh, of cereal. I'm picking on Kellogg again here. Um, and there's a health narrative. Uh, many times we have a very convenience focused narrative or, or culture around food um, or a treat yourself kind of uh, culture as well. Um, but what happens during, uh, during a time like this? Why do people choose the foods that they've chosen? Do we have a big shift all of a sudden to, to, to making our own food? Are we um, going back to what, the way that our grandmother or grandfather used to make food? And it just kind of depends, at least our perception of going back to that and maybe comfort from making foods from, from raw ingredients are, are some of the things that we've seen. There's been some interesting stuff written about the, 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 the reasons people chose these things. Um, sometimes they're because they're stable, right? Bread, rice, uh, especially rice, flour, those kinds of things are stable, um, stable staples. But even pasta that people were choosing um, maybe they weren't even thinking as long-term because a lot of times you saw lasagna pasta being left on the shelf when that's one of the best sort of meals you could make and freeze um, to have food for a long period of time. So culture and knowledge and lots of other things start to inter, uh, interweave. And, and I mentioned bread making, Instagram is full of people making bread and posting pictures of it. Um, and certainly there's a culture, uh, a culture around that. And so sometimes um, this, culture of bread making and posting images is a classist perspective too. I know um, that Liz has some interest in, in kind of thinking about narratives around healthy eating during this time. Sure. So this is um, something that I've noticed, you know, we're all posting our bread, um, bread pictures, and that's assuming that you have those ingredients, um, making all of these fun new foods. Another thing that I've seen as a trend amongst nutritionists and dietitians is that a lot of people are saying, you know what, this isn't the time to worry about your nutrition. This is a time to just deal with all the other stressors of life. So some of the stressors of life that have been happening because of this coronavirus outbreak is that a lot of people are worried about their health. They're worried about access to health care. They're worried about job losses. They're worried about low food security. Um, one of the, my primary goals and one of my jobs is to promote healthy eating in people who are um, low food security and low income, who suffer from all of these stressors on a day-to-day -day life. So if we as an upper and, middle, um, upper and middle class are thinking about this time as being too stressful to worry about healthy eating, why do we put such an emphasis on these low income populations who are already under those stressors consistently at that same level? So this is a really good opportunity for us to reflect on our own goals. Um, you know, if we are feeling too stressed out to worry about our health, maybe we can show some compassion and love for those who are constantly under these types of stressors of low food security and low access to healthcare. One of my favorite culture kind of, I don't know, it wasn't a culture clash, but a culture story from this was a, a, an image that circulated pretty heavily, uh, especially in Italian circles. Anyway, this, this is a, basically an image from Twitter where this, uh, this Twitter person posted, um, showing that a lot of the pasta was missing, but not this one kind, penne liche, which is this smooth um, <clears throat> penne pasta. And it's because it's regarded generally as terrible. It's smooth, it doesn't hold sauce. So even in times of hunger and crisis, nobody's choosing penne liche, it's terrible. Well, this opened up what's a really a common uh, sort of cultural divide in Italy between North and South. This pasta comes from the South and it isn't intended to hold, hold sauce. It's intended to soak the sauce into the pasta. And so it was this great debate about um, Northerners not knowing how to use the pasta right, um, this pasta being terrible. And the point is that culture drives a lot of different behaviors, even in times of crisis like this. And this one was just kind of, I think, slightly lighthearted in the sense that um, even in Italy, people are choosing based on, uh, on culture and cultures of, of food. I'll just start talking without unmuting. <laughs> um, we're also seeing lots of environmental impacts uh, from the pandemic within the food system. I know you've heard 
in other lectures about all sorts of different environmental impacts. And in terms of the food system, we have them too. Uh, it really boils down to unsustainable production and consumption practices. Um, and these practices have contributed to larger amounts of solid plastic. I know somebody was talking about what to do with all their plastic bags in the chat. I take mine to Kroger, like my Kroger is still taking them, but I also keep seeing on Pinterest um, that you can make like weave them into baskets. I am not crafty, but if you can do that, you do it. Um, and food waste. Um, lots of people panic buying, getting more than they um, can ever possibly eat as well as the food losses that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and those become a big deal in terms of the environment. Uh, if you were going to turn food waste into a country, it would be the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions after China the United, and the United States, uh, with India coming in fourth. Uh, so that puts it into a little bit of perspective, right? And it's also important to realize that there's a lot of land used to produce food that isn't eaten. Uh, so um, you can see kind of where that would be, uh, the kind of area that we're talking about, which would, um, if we put all that land together, it would make the second largest country um, on earth. So a touch smaller than Russia, but much larger than Canada. And so I really like this map, mostly because I'm a geographer and like it's required to love maps. Um, but it really puts us into how this is a global problem. This is not just a Western problem and this is not just a developing world problem. We all have problems with food loss and food waste. Um, so in Geography 110, we do an exercise where people have to look for their food print. Uh, I can put the link up if you guys want to take the little quiz and it tells you kind of where your food comes from. Uh, so one kind of interesting thing that might happen in terms of the pandemic is we're all looking at local production. I know in the chat you guys were talking about victory gardens and raised beds, uh, but we're also trying to give money to local businesses, right? So I do think that's one positive thing that might come out is that we're really paying attention to where our food comes from. So. Great, so I'm gonna move through this as quickly as possible so we can get to questions. Um, but one of the last things that we're gonna talk about is how economics influence our food system. This is something I'm extremely nervous about talking about in my class um, because I am not an economist and I don't actually understand the economy well at all. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to talk about is economies of scale. So just like with our farming and our large farm production, a lot of our processing, distributing, um, and food service establishments are larger food companies. Um, so on this next image that I have for you, um, this is really kind of showing how a lot of the manufactured foods that we see on the shelf really come down to a few very large companies. And this is true throughout the food system, uh, the food supply chain. So we see that large companies are actually a lot more efficient at um, processing food. So we can get our food for a lot cheaper. They can produce something, and that's something as um, Chris had mentioned that we really value as consumers. We want something that's cheap. And so this is just on the food processing end. Again, there are distributors, food service establishments, um, that are also kind of taking a big chunk of that economic pie. So one of my favorite activities to do with my students is to evaluate the various incomes that we see across the food supply chain. So I created a table um, that my uh, 2020 class um, had filled in. So they were each in charge of finding an estimated annual income by um, assuming that everybody in this chart worked 40 hours per week for various employees within large companies from ent entry level positions clear up to the CEO. So as you can see, there is a vast difference between um, these different incomes. Um, the small scale farmer, as I'd mentioned, um, makes roughly about, um, sorry, the large scale farmer makes about five times more than the small scale farmer. So this really um, brings to that point, the idea that um, small scale farmers really have to rely on outside income. But we will, if you'll also think back about that food dollar that I talked about, um, the farmers are getting such a small chunk of that food dollar. So the average CEO of a food 
a large food processor, retailer, fast food chain, um, is making at least 100 times more than the yearly salary of a large scale um, farmer. So they're making a vast amount more, and that's just the CEO of that company per year. We can also see that those who are at the entry level positions often get paid significantly less than the CEOs of that company. Um, I always ask my students to estimate how much they think a CEO should get paid more than an entry level position and then I get answers ranging from about five times to 20 times more. Um, however, the average CEO of these large food companies makes about 550 times what the average low level employee makes. So a substantial difference between the low level employees and those at the top. So just that CEO. In addition to this income disparity, uh, many of these employees don't receive benefits. These employees are now recognized as being essential workers and are often being called heroes by many. Kroger, for example, was offering a hero bonus for their employees. Um, however, as you can see, um, if we're considering these employees essential, does it make sense that we're paying them wages that are close to the poverty line? Workers considered essential are putting themselves at a high health risk, but often don't have benefits, including health care. Another issue that has been brought to light um, is the idea of paid sick leave for food handlers. So rarely do food service and food handling jobs provide paid sick leave. This forces many of these employees to decide between coming to work sick or not making money for that day. Um, that's probably not a really good thing for any of our health um, as those are the people who are handling our food, but this is really brought to light in the idea of this very um, viral COVID-19 outbreak. So um, I was busy in the chat, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, lots of good stuff going on there. But as we talked about, there's a lot of complicated issues in the food system. In some ways, um, it might be, our food system might be proven to be resilient uh, during the pandemic, but in a lot of other cases, the current pandemic draws out some issues that you've seen um, or causes bottlenecks within the food supply chain. Um, we see lots of change in food loss, um, potential for more food waste, increased food insecurity and reliance on food pantries, um, and even just your average person going into the, the supermarket feeling the impact of when things aren't available. We're just not used to that. Um, so we just thought we would throw out a few things before the Q&A about what you could do. Um, just a little bit of ideas. Ashley, I don't know if you want to mention this. Oh, yes. Um, so to reduce food waste, everybody thinks about composting first because that's what we've been taught. And composting is really not as hard as you feel like it's going to be. You can even do it in little tiny amounts. It was sitting next to me, I had to. Um, but the really big way that you can reduce food waste is by only buying what you need and ignoring um, expiration dates. Don't listen to them, they're lying to you. The only expir expiration dates that are um, certified by the FDA are for baby formula. So listen to those. But anything else, give it a little sniff, give it a little taste. If there are no spores, it's probably fine. You'll know if it tastes gross. Put your egg in water, it'll be okay. <laughs> um, we also had on there to, um, you know, uh, cook from your pantry, but we have students doing a great program throughout most of the years, um, since 2014 anyway, and they're continuing it this summer. Um, by doing videos. Here's one of our students, Morgan, uh, who's in our Cooking Matters program. So our students do um, community education around food, um, cooking, budgeting, planning, all that stuff um, aimed at uh, folks that have uh, lower incomes and more risk for food insecurity. So, but one of the big things that we talk about is cooking from your pantry. Go to the pantry first, look at what's there um, and, and make your plan from there. Um, you bought that stuff, it looked good at one point. So it's time <laughs> to use some of that. Um, we got a few other things here. Yeah, so one of the things that I really uh, say is know where your food comes from. And that last, um, that last one, vote. So there's, um, there's somebody, Michael Pollan, if you haven't heard of him, you probably will. He's a really good um, person to read about if you don't really know much about the food system. Um, but he always says vote with your fork, and I agree with that. So vote with your fork, know where your food comes from. But also, if you can see food-related issues on a ballot, or somebody who cares passionately about food related issues, then vote, be involved. So be involved with your food system as much as possible. 
So that's the slide show that we've got and the, and the stuff that we've prepared, but we're happy to take for those um, who can stick around. We're happy to take questions and things like that. Am I doing your job, Francesca? I don't mean to step in. I'm not <laughs> no, it's cool. Thank you all so much. I really like, um, someone else commented on this and I agree. I like the round robin way and Rich, you, you did this in like the scope. You covered so much. Um, so that was fabulous. Um, I have a question um, about a, a comparative question. If we look at the US compared to other countries, which we did um, a little bit with a different type of pasta that's not um, selling out in Italy, um, when we think about production, distribution, food insecurity, um, the effect on the environment, where do we compare to other countries on these types of indicators? Are we worse? Are we better? Well, um, you, you mentioned a bunch of them and I, I wish I had better data right in front of me. I mean, we, this one's a tough one to answer from the food security perspective because everyone defines it just a little bit differently. I think we've got some, a lack of some safety nets. We spend less per capita on food than most other places do. Um, so we tend to have less deep food security, not that it doesn't exist, that ha real hunger doesn't exist, but um, you know, it kind of depends too on developed economies or, or not. You know, I think when you get to um, developing economies, you know, the, the deep food security numbers are much, much higher than, than we see here in the U.S. Um, in countries that have a little bit more of a safety net or social programs, then our food security rates are, are quite a bit higher than those. So this is an interesting question, and I also don't have any um, direct answers for you. But one of the things that I like to bring up is, um, so one of the places that I'm really interested in is Cuba because right now they are this forerunner in urban agriculture and sustainability. So they're doing a lot with this sustainability agriculture, um, but they're also doing this out of necessity and they've had um, some severe food shortages. So even though we can applaud them on their sustainability and their urban agriculture, what is the cost of this or why was it um, a problem in the first place? And so it's really hard to compare because you can compare one value, but at what cost is that other value? Um, so is it, you know, uh, having other issues with um, food security or through for public health. So it's really interesting and I wish I had more answers too. <laughs> Same, I wish I could like answer this in like a real data specific way. Uh, but in terms of waste, uh, we're not great. <laughs> and that's mostly because we have kind of this culture of overbuying and of taking um, more than we can eat. Uh, the whole buffet eyes being bigger than your stomach kind of thing. Um, but I think that there's always room to do better, right? And so that's basically the... Thank you. We had someone in the chat asking about how um, meal um, subscription services fit into all of this. Um, have they become, I think we know they've become more popular, but where do they fit into the food system that you all are speaking of? So I love this question. Um, I don't have a lot of data on this, um, but I do have um, a, pr a prior student, uh, one of our recent graduates from nutrition actually works with HelloFresh. And he came, well, he came to my virtual food systems class to kind of talk about this. Um, HelloFresh is a really interesting model. They use local farmers. Um, and for most of those farmers, HelloFresh is their only consumer. And so they've been selling out um, like crazy. And so they're actually seeing a lot more growth on those farms. HelloFresh was seeing so much growth and so many new customers that they cut down all of their forms of advertising, except for their direct salesmen. Um, HelloFresh is also really interesting with their wage, um, with those wage gaps that we talked about before. HelloFresh CEOs don't get paid substantially more than those below them, and most of the employees actually get paid a pretty decent wage. So um, they're just a really interesting model of a food system and something that I think we can talk about a little bit more. But yes, I know that their subscriptions are definitely going up for sure. <laughs> uh, we have several people, Ashley, this question is probably more for you. The others can chime in as, as desired, but uh, asking, well, why do, why do we have expiration dates if they're not, if they're not correct? Okay, we have expiration dates for two reasons. First, expiration dates, again, for everything but baby formula. Uh, please listen to the expiration dates on baby formula. <laughs> um, really talk about food quality, not food safety. So it's more of like a best buy date. 
Um, so if you want, you know, your asparagus to taste like it just came out of the yard, eat it by now, right? Um, beyond that, they're also put on by the manufacturers. The USDA does not require expiration dates on most things. Um, so manufacturers, A, want you to buy more products and B, don't want to be legally liable if you like eat a can of beans from 1994 and get botulism, right? So <laughs> it's mostly about the quality of food and giving you a good indicator, but really your best indicator are your five senses. Smell it, you'll know. Perfect. Um, now, a uh, final question, um, and I want to invite people to attend Meet the Profs, of course, or head to the Facebook discussion group if they have further questions they didn't get answered. Um, but my final question is, and you got to this a little bit in the chat, what kinds of change do you think we'll see as a result of COVID-19? The person in the discussion group was asking, you know, how will it affect us in terms of eating at home? Will we con continue that? But I'm wondering, will it also force us to examine how we can solve some of these deeper issues that uh, COVID-19 has shined a spotlight on? So change, will we, will we change as, as a result of what's happened? Um, I mean, I think, unfortunately, for a lot of small business owners who are restaurant owners, um, we'll have less to choose from, <laughs> for one thing. Um, and um, so I don't know, you, you know, it's hard to speculate, but I think people have discovered some subset of people who've had the privilege to be able to cook at home more that maybe they can pull this thing off. Um, however, you know, t as our time constraints change too, meaning we've got, um, you know, if you've got kids and the sports start back up, or if your job starts to ramp up because they're busier again, or whatever your situation is, um, it'll be interesting to because we didn't get better at cooking during this pandemic with those same constraints in place and so when those return um it's hard it's hard to imagine that we won't feel the same kind of um conflict around that but uh, so from that perspective you know i'm just not i'm not sure but we probably learned some new recipes that are pretty good and so i would imagine that there may be some uptick um uptick in that you know maybe we've used learned to use dried beans and other grains and things like that and so i kind of think of it from that perspective um i also think that um that uh that, yeah the, the lack the reduction in numbers of, of restaurants and things could have an impact on that uh, too in that community um so i'll stop there So I think that, um, I guess I'm pretty pessimistic actually about the uh, changes that we'll see. Um, I think the people who are able to withstand the um, economic strain are gonna be the larger companies. Um, and so we are gonna see a lot of small businesses close down. I think the restaurants that we see close down, but I'm hoping that what that means is that people are gonna start becoming more aware. Um, people are gonna hear a lot more about this food loss. And so I think awareness is gonna increase. And maybe through awareness, people are going to start getting more involved in their food system and realize that they, you know, I think the problem is, is we want cheap food, um, but at what cost? At what cost to all of these other aspects of our lives? So, um, and so maybe with that awareness, people will start making positive changes within the food system so that they can kind of, you know, vote with their fork and um, make those positive changes happen. I'm hopeful, yay. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you're hopeful. Um, you all were wonderful. Thank you to our three panelists for sharing your time and knowledge with us. Thank you to the audience for joining us and asking excellent questions. Don't forget that you can continue your conversations on the Facebook group. And another way to join the conversations is the Meet the Prof sessions. Students who've registered for course credit can join us Thursday at 4 p.m. in Blackboard Collaborate. Community members can join us at noon on Friday in Blackboard Collaborate. There will be links provided. If you have any questions, please contact COVID class coordinator at owu.edu. And we will see you again on Wednesday at 4 p.m. for 60 to zero in nothing flat, the impact of COVID on the American economy and the prospects for recovery with Dr. Bob Gitter. Thank you all. <laughs>